Hello, everyone. My name is David Bernstein. I am president and CEO of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Welcome to this webinar um, on the public health situation in Israel. Uh, we're still very, very delighted to be doing this with Hadassah, which is a longtime partner of JCPA. And we're, it's really wonderful to be able to combine our two networks. And we're so thrilled to be able to work with uh, Janice and to work with uh, Hadassah and, and creating this opportunity for our constituents. Um, one, one, one thought before we, uh, I, I turn it over to Janice. Um, this is, these are extraordinary times and um, we're, we're all following the situation in our own countries very closely. Um, as, as a Zionist, when I um, look at the numbers of cases and of deaths in America, I, then my next move is to see the situation in Israel. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm following that very closely with, with pride. It's, um, it's interesting to see the contrast between Israel and the United States and many other countries in the world. I'm looking forward to learning more about that on this webinar today. And I'm really excited to um, be able to do this with, with Hadassah. So, um, I'm going to turn it over to Janice. Um, Janice weinman Jornstein is uh, one of the great leaders in the Jewish community. She's executive director and CEO of Hadassah. Janice, thank you so much for uh, hosting this with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, to you and to uh, Melanie Gorlick for having invited us. Um, Hadassah is really delighted to be part of this webinar and particularly um, that our uh, director of one of our campuses of Hadassah in Israel, um, uh, Professor Yoram Weiss is also with us. I do want to say that um, we are really not only members of JCPA here in the United States, but many, many of our members overlap with your membership. And so we work very closely together in different communities and we really have established a long-standing relationship that we're very, very proud of. I also want to share with you that I was the president of the New York JCRC. Um, and when people ask me, what was the most um, wonderful professional or volunteer experience you've had in your life? I honestly, sincerely, and very, very enthusiastically always answer my best experience was to be president of the New York City JCRC. So I think there's a particularly close tie between us. Um, Hadassah is unique um, in the being an, a not-for-profit, a Jewish not-for-profit here in the United States in that we are major stakeholders in the land of Israel. Um, we worked for generations on building the health system in Israel, and that is personified and epitomized in our two hospitals in Jerusalem, one at Mount Scopus and one at Ein Karim. We also do a great deal of work here in the United States, um, which is really done by over nearly 300,000 of our members and donors who are, um, are reside in every state, every territory, and every congressional district. And as a result of that, we have been really both interested in and effective in advocacy efforts around the country and um, through our Washington office, which is headed by Karen Pagan Burrell. So just to give you an example of the interface between JCRC's um, JCPA and our advocacy efforts, two years ago, I went to a JCRC Congressional Breakfast in New York, which is one of my favorite events. It's uh, really a highlight for the New York community. And then Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney got up and said that she has for 18 years tried to um, bill, uh, pass a bill having to do with Holocaust education. And um, after she spoke, I went up to her and I said, you know, Congresswoman Maloney, Hadassah would be only too happy to work with you in trying to pass that bill. And lo and behold, it, last week it passed uh, the Senate, it had already passed the House, and it is on its way to be signed by the President. So that gives you a really good example of the kind of advocacy work that we do and the kind of interface that we have with um, JCPA. And it really means a lot because this Never Again Education Act is really critical for the future 
of the next generation here in the United States. It teaches the effects of hatred and bigotry. It provides resources, it provides teacher training, it provides curricula um, that can be adapted by schools and by uh, districts and by states. And so we really feel that this is a very, very important a mutual interest that we share, that of anti-Semitism, which I know is very much a part of the JCPA agenda. We also, like you, are very interested in BDS. And also we have supported the Palestinian Curriculum uh, Reform Act so that in fact, um, Palestinian children really get the information that they need rather than the information that is fed to them. So with regard to COVID-19, I'm going to turn over to what we do in Israel. Um, our passions are really very strong and we feel that um, both here in our communities and, and elsewhere, we want to protect our communities. We want to provide research that is important um, to really slow the spread of COVID-19. And our hospital in Israel at Ein Karim has really been at the forefront which Professor Weiss will share with you. I just simply want to uh, let you know some of the value added elements that our hospital had during the crisis in Israel. So needless to say, we treated hundreds of uh, patients, but interestingly enough, we were the only hospital to have an isolated building, a building where three floors which was empty because it was being renovated. So we had three floors that were able to be used by COVID uh, patients. Um, we're now working, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor Weiss, on 17 different tests. We um, are the number one lab in the country in terms of different forms of testing. Um, we had provided childcare services during this period of time for our frontline workers. And finally, and I, this is really um, very, very unusual and very, very important. We were the only hospital to test our healthcare personnel every five days. And there was a clip on CNN here in the United States speaking to that as an example of what can be done. Um, and it was done at our hospital in Israel. Um, so our, our, our really our commitment to COVID-19, our commitment to healthcare generally um, has really been extensive. We are doing many, many things here. As other organizations, we've had seminars, we've had um, webinars like this. Um, we have had um, major educational sessions with doctors from Israel and nurses and doctors from Israel and nurses here in the United States as well. Those have really spoken to some of the causes and treatments for COVID-19. But importantly, we've also had a number of webinars on how to deal with stress relative to COVID-19. And so that too has been an added dimension of the type of um, work that we provide here. We have created through our Hadassah International a resource book um, on how to deal with COVID-19, and that's being used by nurses, ho nursing homes throughout the world. Um, and in addition, we've also had many, many local activities, which I know JCRCs have been involved in as well. Our women have made masks that have been used um, domestically and in Israel. And it's the kind of thing that kind of activity that we really feel is fundamental to the way in which our communities can participate in dealing with COVID-19. So let me just say that we are really grateful and very, very deeply interested in continuing to work side by side with the JCPA. We thank you again for this opportunity. We know that there are many, many people on this um, Zoom, and we hope that what uh, Professor Weiss will impart to you will be helpful in the way in which you plan for the future. Thank you so very much. David, you're muted. Sorry about that. So uh, Dr. Yoram Weiss is the director of the Hadassah Hebrew University Medical Center in Karim Campus, Jerusalem, Israel. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weiss, for being with us, and we'll look forward to your uh, presentation. Thank you. So hello, everybody. And uh, I will take you through the presentation now. And uh, 
Do you see the presentation? Yes, we do. Wonderful. So um, I will address the issue of COVID-19 in Israel and especially the response that we've taken at Adassa to the COVID-19 outbreak and give you a little bit of a scientific background saying, remind, reminding to those who know and telling those who don't know that before becoming director of the uh, hospital, I was director of the intensive care unit. And at the beginning of 2000, at the issue, when at the time of the SARS epidemic, I was highly involved in uh, dealing with this infection, which was actually a virus that is a relative of the COVID-19. If we look at the uh, presentation of COVID-19 in Israel, what uh, comes up very, very quickly is that Israel actually has come to the point where there's very little lead, less, less left out of the outbreak. And actually two areas, which is Bnei Brak, a neighborhood near Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, are still the areas where we see cases of COVID-19. Most is, of Israel is at this point free of COVID-19 with very, very few cases. Also in these areas in Bnei Barak and Jerusalem today, we see very few cases. And it usually it is between one to two cases a day that are being brought to the hospital. And the, the number of patients that are identified in Israel today are between one to 20 every day, depending on uh, the day of the week and the occurrence. As was mentioned before, we took our old building and we converted our old building into a building to serve our COVID-19 patients. And this is the old building and this is how it will look like when we finish renovating it within the next two years. And I think this is one of the major issues that we realized at the beginning of the outbreak. And if you look at the literature, you'll see that there's a lot of people talking about it today. And this is the fact that we have to keep in mind all the time, especially now when we have the COVID-19 under control, we couldn't allow us we shouldn't allow uh, neglecting other diseases. And the literature is full with cases that were neglected over the few two months, the first two months of the outbreak, where patients actually didn't receive the treatment that they had to receive, either for heart attack or for brain stroke or because of the cancer. And these are things that should not happen. Every hospital must be arranged in a way that it can take care of the COVID-19 patients while it's taking care of all other patients. If we look at the outbreak at Adassa, what comes to in mind is very quickly that a lot of the patients you see with respiratory symptoms actually do not have COVID-19. Out of 1,129 patients that were admitted to our emergency room with respiratory problems and with fever, only 88 were positive for COVID-19. Actually, the most patients with COVID-19 that were brought to the hospital were brought by our emergency medical services in directly into the COVID-19 uh, um, departments. And these are 330 patients and out of them 44 required ICU. When I'm saying 44 required ICU, you should understand that our regular ICU has only 16 beds and that 45 ICU patients means that these are the most severely sick patients. Those that need full support all the time. And then we had also those required intermediate care. The difference is that the ICU patients required ventilation. The intermediate care patients didn't require maybe ventilation, but they required devices that provide very, very high flow of oxygen. What you see on the lower right side of the screen is the age distribution. And I think that what comes in mind that except for very young ages between zero to 17, where the, um, the disease is basically very rare. And we know today that there are a few cases, especially cardiac cases in kids. If we look, we see that it's pretty much evenly spread over all ages, but not surprisingly, those that are in the ICU are those that are 65 and more. And this is because usually these patients have more comorbidities. Comorbidities means that they have other diseases like COPD, which is a disease that it affects your breathing. Uh, it can have heart disease. They have obesity. 
and these other diseases, cancer, immune suppression, these patients are the most vulnerable for the COVID-19 severe uh, demonstration or the severe cases. What we can see in this uh, graph is something that is very important to remember, and this is that at the end of the outbreak, and this is towards, if you look here on the right side of the screen, and I'm showing it, you see that at the end of it, when we have already discharged all other patients, we remain with a few patients that are especially patients that are ICU patients. And the ICU patients, those that are ventilated, will take a very, very long time to recover. And this is very, very important for any hospital system and any medical system in any country to understand with the COVID-19, those that will develop the most severe form of disease will require a very long time of convalescence and of recovery. And it's important to realize that and prepare yourself for that. What we've done very quickly, as we realized that we are exposed to the COVID-19, was actually understand that, as I said before, we must provide for a duplicate infrastructure for those that do not have COVID-19 and to separate completely those that have COVID-19 in order to allow free access of all those that have other problems to the hospital in a safe manner. And the other thing that was mentioned before is that we very quickly realized that because we are in Jerusalem and we are in an area that is actually an endemic area for the COVID-19 in Israel, we must test our workforce. And the reason we must test them and screen them is because it is very important to identify those in your workforce who can pose either a da danger to other workers, but even more importantly, to our patients. Please remember that Hadassah is a tertiary care center, has a lot of patients that are actually immune compromised. And these are the patients that are under the highest risk of COVID-19 infection. And the last thing which we'll discuss is the safety. All the time, keep in mind the safety of your workforce, your patients, but once more, your workforce, physicians, nurses, workers. At the beginning of the infection, what we've done very quickly is we realized that we cannot allow every person to come in. And for this reason, every visitor had to be screened. And after being screened and filling a questionnaire and measuring his temperature, we provided them with gloves, with hand sanitizer, and with masks. All our staff were instructed to undergo a routine surveillance, as we mentioned before. And we developed a leading RT-PCR lab to measure and to test for COVID-19. And this was done in collaboration with the Hebrew University. And we became one of the leading uh, centers, laboratories in Israel to test for COVID-19. And as you see, we were able to measure up to 3,000 cases a day. In Israel, we came in, in the entirety of Israel at the peak of the testing, we came to about 30,000 tests a day that were done in Israel for the Israeli population. Some of it, most of it in drive-ins where people were able to drive with their car and measure, and obviously in our emergency rooms, etc. Every person that was part of the group that was identified to be surveilled from our workforce, which is nurses, physicians, had to carry a tag that showed that they are free of corona and this was retested every five days. Another thing that we've done is that we developed many years ago at Hadassah a uh, hand sanitizer called Hadassol. And because of the lack of hand sanitizers in the market, we became the major provider of hand sanitizer for the state of Israel and for all other hospitals. And an issue that was brought up by many, many medical systems all over the world, we were very careful and we invested a lot of energy into being sure that we provide protective personal equipment to all our workforce at all times. And this was one of the major issues that we dealt with all the time to be sure that we have enough personal protective equipment. One of the issues that came up very quickly is that we realized that we would like to introduce technology, information technology, and also introduce what is called bring your own device 
which are devices that you can either patch on the patient or you can give them a watch. And these devices can send you information, medical information on the patient, the pulse, the blood pressure, the saturation, which is very important in these patients. And by this, you are negating the risk for your workforce, for the physician or for the nurse to go in into the unit every time to measure these uh, numbers. Hence, we use this, but it is very important to remember that as you're using this, or you're using information technology in order to allow communication between the patient and his family, which is extremely important. Because please remember, these patients are completely isolated in these departments. And for this reason, having information technologies, tablets, that allow them to communicate with the families are extremely important. However, please remember the issue of cybersecurity, because when you move this information over the internet, you may expose yourself to allowing other people to view the data. So anyone who's using that should be very careful and be mindful of the cybersecurity. The well-being of our patient that I mentioned before using the tablets to be in touch with their families is extremely important and we try to provide them the food and also a little bit of fun while they stayed in our departments that were completely isolated. Another part of Hadassah, of those who know Hadassah and the position of Hadassah in Jerusalem, is actually one, something that is part of our goals at Hadassah, and this is Bridges to Peace. And during this period of COVID-19, we continue this collaboration of actually having Hadassah as an island of peace and having collaboration between everybody. And this was part of a Washington Post editorial that was published on the work in a COVID-19 ward at Hadassah. An important part that we've developed is a BI, which allowed us to get information on all the information, on the key information that is important to run the hospital while we're having the COVID-19 outbreak. And this BI system served us in order to allow us on a twice daily, day, twice daily meeting to have a strategic tactical management team that met in all key stakeholders of the hospital that are related either to medical care or to supplies were meeting around the table or through a Zoom and we were discussing the epidemiology and the prevalence of the disease in Jerusalem and what we see in our hospital, the patient and safety of staff and patients, the safety of patients and staff, the hospital stocks, as I mentioned, was extremely important. And this is not only for protective equipment. Please remember that because of the high demand for anesthetic drugs, this was another issue that we had to deal with all the time. And also the use of hospital infrastructure. As you have an increased number of patients coming in, you must prepare to be able to provide and care for the increasing number of patients that come in. We need all the time to open up new departments. And we ended up opening up to 130 beds in our hospital for COVID-19 patients. Another issue that we went into was collecting plasma from patients that have recovered. And this is a very important part because we don't have as yet a vaccine, and we'll address that later. But what we could do is take hyper, produce out of the plasma of these patients hypergamma uh, globulins, and this can be then used to treat the most severely sick patients. And this is something the FDA has started in the United States and in Israel, also MDA and us, and we were the first one to start it, working with our ultra-orthodox group where there was a very high incidence of the disease to identify those that have high levels of uh, immunoglobulins and to use that in order to give plasma to our patients. I want to share with you very quickly a little bit about the pathophysiology of how the disease develops. And there are actually three parts of the disease that are completely different. There is one part which is the light part of the injury, and this is the beginning of the disease. And this is on the upper right side of the screen now. And here you see the alveoli. There's a little bit of cells that are in the alveoli, but the alveoli is pretty much empty and clean. On the picture below, what you can see is also the blood vessels. 
And please remember that one of the issues that we learned in this disease, and we'll address it in a moment, is a hypercarbulable state in some of our patients can develop clots in these blood vessels. The next step is when the disease becomes moderate. And these are the patients that are in intermediate care. These are the patients that are at home and suddenly feel that they have difficulty breathing and they have actually water in their lungs. Water that is with cells, but especially it's mostly water. A little bit of protein, but still not severe amounts of protein. These are the patients that when you give them oxygen will recover. These are the patients that when you give them medications, you can still reverse the disease. And then on the left lower corner of the screen, you see those that have already the severe state. These are the patients where the alveoli are filled up, the lungs are filled up with protein rich fluid, which contains cells. And these patients can also later on produced to develop fibrosis, which will make them crippled respiratory-wise for a short time or for a longer time. It depends on the level of damage to the alveoli and to the lungs. The next step we learned is of a hyperinflammatory response that these patients develop. And this is very important to remember because some of the young patients that supposedly recover out of COVID-19 and suddenly develop TIAs, which is transit ischemic attack of the brain or a stroke, and others can develop also cardiac problems. And this is because of the hypercarbulable, the clotting of blood within small blood vessels in different organs. And this is a major part of the disease, and we need to remember that. This will also explain part of the medications that are being used on these patients. Speaking of the research at Adasa, and the use of medications at Hadassah. It is important to show you that at Hadassah as a research center, we have at this point uh, a certain number of studies that were approved. And this is about 25 studies were approved and we have another 13 studies that are on the way to be approved. We are associated with a WHO study which is also using a drug that you heard a lot of, which is resmevedir, which is the drug that is a nucleot nucleotide analog. And nucleotides are the parts that form RNA and DNA. And what this is, this is a false nucleotide that when incorporated into the RNA of the virus, when the re virus replicates, it basically creates a virus, an RNA that is non-functional and for this reason, the virus is not infectious anymore. So this is the idea of the drug. It was first developed for Ebola, if you remember, in Africa. And now it's being used for COVID-19. And this is one of the drugs that have shown a lot of promise. Another part is repurposing of drugs. And the repurposing of drugs goes, and we're trying to attack different parts of the, uh, where the virus is causing damage. Now, if you look on your right hand side, you will see that the virus penetrates into the cell and in order to penetrate into the cell, it has to connect to a receptor. The receptor is called an ACE2 receptor. And we can use drugs that can prevent this uh, adherence of the virus to the cells. And these are two drugs that, we, that are used also by, in our studies at Adasa. Another way is to work with drugs which are very well known because your president, one of them was mentioned a lot to your president. This is chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine and also lopinavir or ritonavir. And these are drugs that basically are associated with the translation and the proteolysis of the virus. These are parts of the formation of the virus. And if we stop this, then we stop the infection. Other areas that are extremely important are understanding through blood samples and through DNA studies on patients that develop the most severe form of the disease, characterizing the biomarkers and the susceptibility or resistance to disease of some patients. I would like to share with you something that maybe some of you know, that we know that some communities, especially in the US, it was noted, but also in England, that are non-white have a much higher preponderance of a more severe form of the disease. 
We do not know if it is because they have more comorbidities, diseases that can actually allow the virus to flourish much better, or is it related to some kind of a change in their DNA that makes them more vulnerable? Another part of drugs that were used by in our by our physicians are to silizumab. These are drugs that are actually blockers of interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a drug that suppresses the hyperinflammatory state and prevents development of the hyperinflammatory state which goes also with the blood clotting and other problems. Finally, our researchers are working also on enriching of T cells that are already SARS-CoV-2 specific and giving them to those individuals that are at highest risk. And you take these cells out of the blood of patients that have recovered. This is, at this moment, at the very first stages of clinical trials at our institution. And finally, not related to Adasa, but in Israel, as in the United States, as, as in Europe, many people and many organizations are working on developing a vaccine. The last information is that Moderna, a company in the United States, was able to do a small study, which is called a phase one study on about 30 patients, and developed that they may have some kind of a success with patients developing immune globulins, developing immunity. These are very promising stages or results, but still these are very preliminary results and we have to be patient. Another part that is of our work in the institution is that people at our institution have developed two ventilators that are low technology ventilators to assist and ventilate patients in a, case, in a case that we come to the point where we were concerned in Israel that we get to, which is that we are overwhelmed with patients and we don't have enough regular ICU ventilators to ventilate our patients. And these are ventilators that use an AMBU bag and they compress the AMBU bag and ventilate the patient. Here I'm giving you an example of a ventilator that was developed. The cost of developing it or building it is less than a thousand dollars per unit. It was put, all the information was put on the uh, open source on the internet and can be downloaded. And actually countries in South America have downloaded the information and created these ventilators. And uh, we're very proud about this, that we were able to help other communities outside of Israel in their preparedness for the COVID-19 infection. Another uh, development is, as I mentioned before, to those that have in our intermediate care, you want to supply high oxygen flow. And this is another company in Israel called SodaStream, which is a subsidiary of PepsiCo. And they developed as a partnership with us, a high flow oxygen uh, system that is used in our, that is now being on the study in our hospital. Finally, what is the future? And the future is complicated, but I know that all of us want to forget of social distancing, want to forget of hand sanitation all the time, and want to go back to our normal lives. Unfortunately, as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in the United States said, and I agree with him, there's a very good chance that it will take us between 12, 12 to 18 months to develop a vaccine. Please remember, that when we have the vaccine, still it will take some time for us to distribute it and vaccinate the entire population. And in this comes also the issue of herd immunity, which means that we have to have about 75 to 80% of the population vaccinated in order to get protection also for those who are not vaccinated. So finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, all hospitals must understand that they must prepare themselves for the next step of the coronavirus outbreak. And this is, we brought the coronavirus under control, but we have to remember at the back of our minds all the time that we have, and I'm speaking now of hospital directors and physicians, we have to remember that we have all the time the risk of being exposed to patients with the COVID-19 infection, but at the same time, we need to prepare ourselves to continue to provide the best medical care to all our patients. Finally, leadership. 
At these times, leadership is the most important and hospital management must be all the time accessible to all staff members and to patients if needed. Managers must walk around the hospital and be seen in the hospital all the time because the stress of the teams is extremely high and by you being there with them is the most important thing. I can tell you, I'm so proud. We had so many people that volunteered to work in our COVID-19 departments. We didn't have a problem of lack of people. We actually had an overflow of people wanting to work there. And I think part of it is because really the feeling at Adasa that we work for our patients and that we're so proud to work for our patients and we work all of us in collaboration. So it is very important for all of us to remember that. And as I would like to finish with that is really, you can talk about infrastructure, you can talk about science, but at the end, what makes a medical institution in a country work is the people that make it. Thank you very much for your listening and I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, I am going to ask people to put their questions in the question chat box. Um, in the meantime, there's a couple that are coming in, but I'd like to ask a couple follow-up questions. Um, you spoke of a vaccine, and I think one of the first articles that I read about a vaccine was about the potential of a company uh, of a group in Israel. I think it was the Migal Galilee Research Institute that was working on a coronavirus vaccine for livestock, if I'm not mistaken. Are those efforts still underway? What is the potential that Israel might be one of those um, cutting edge countries that could produce a vaccine? Well, as an Israeli, I hope, I hope we will be able to develop a vaccine. And there are two groups. One is the group you mentioned. The other one is the Biological Institute and the Weizmann Institute to work on the vaccine also. However, I should say that developing a vaccine is a timely, it takes time. It's not so simple, it's complicated. I don't want to say that it's not, it's undoable, but please remember that when we had a SARS infection and later on we had also the Middle Eastern SARS, which is still there all the time in the Middle East and in Korea, please remember that we were unable to develop a vaccine for these coronaviruses. So to develop a vaccine for the coronavirus is not simple. I think this is the reason I think also that there's so much excitement about the, the trial that was done in the United States because it's really providing us for the first time a real promise that we may be on the right track. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you, you alluded to the possibility that we're really not out of this anytime soon. I know that Israel um, has opened its economy up slowly. Could you tell us about the metrics that were used in determining whether to open up and um, what you're going to need to look out for in, in terms of a potential second wave that I know in Israel you're concerned about, and certainly in the United States we are as well. So, first of all, the, the, the issue in Israel was that the decision was made that we will start opening up the economy the moment we will see that there's a decrease or there's a flattening of the curve, if people tend to call it. Mm -hmm. And the flattening of the curve occurred in Israel. It occurred because the Israeli government has taken very drastic measures to really bring down the infection rate. And please remember that we were actually under siege for a few days in Israel and for a week around the holiday of Passover and then the New Year, uh, the, the Day of Independence, we were actually not allowed even to walk out of our homes. So the drastic measures were worthwhile in this regard that we were able to bring down the rate of infection and we were able to control it. Now, the most tricky issue is the moment you're opening up is the follow up to see that you don't have a resurgence. And I think here, I will say that I'm a little bit concerned because Israel has decided to move the uh, testing back from the government into the hands of the health management organizations and I'm not sure that the number of tests that are being made now in Israel is so high or sufficiently high as we would like to see in the time when you're opening up your economy. You know that at this stage, it's actually the most important to measure as much as possible. Having said that, I should say that I should not criticize too much. And the reason is very simple. One of the indicators will be the number of patients that come to the hospital. 
And what we see is that in most hospitals in Israel, they don't see any patients anymore. And we're left actually two hospitals in Jerusalem and two hospitals in the Tel Aviv area that see some patients. All the others already for nearly more than a month haven't seen patients. So I think Israel has done a very good job in bringing down the infection rate and controlling the virus at this point. You, you talked about testing. I think you mentioned that Israel has been able to produce up to 30,000 tests a day. Um, I, I did the, the numbers. Uh, Israel is a population about 140th the size of the United States. So if, if we were to if we were to look at that, that would mean that there would be 1.2 million tests per day per capita in the United States. So it's, Israel is certainly outproducing the U.S. right now in terms of the number of tests. Is there a full testing and tracing infrastructure in place now? Can you say with confidence that um, that Israel can can not only test people, figure out what's happening, but also trace as well and then be able to put people um, into isolation? The answer is yes. And as you know, very, I don't know if you know, but the Israeli government has taken draconic measures and the Israeli government has actually uh, is tracing all of those using our cellular phones, are uh, using all those that were in close contact with people that were identified as corona, is carrying the coronavirus. And because the coronavirus is extremely infectious and actually you can be infectious about two to three days before you become sick they're tracing back these people and they're giving them orders to stay in quarantine and i can tell you that we had some uh, it's funny to tell it but we had some uh, at the beginning we had some workers at the hospital that were given sms's and notices by the government that they don't need to go into quarantine and they say listen i'm working in the hospital i'm taking care of corona patients but I think that these measures the Israeli government has taken, and they were met with a lot of a bit of unease with some people in the population, I think proved themselves as being very effective tool in order to try and control the infection. Um, you said that you're still seeing some cases in, in Jerusalem and in many parts of the country, you're really not seeing any cases. Um, we've read about um, some issues with at least small segments of the Haredi population not abiding by uh, shelter in place orders or not abiding by social distancing guidelines. Is that something you're still seeing? Is there a greater awareness in, in these segments of the Haredi population that they're putting themselves at risk in the larger population? I want to speak in favor of the Haredi population. And I want to say that very quickly, the Haredi population and the ultra-Orthodox population understood that uh, the virus is dangerous and it's dangerous not only for elderly people, but especially for elderly patient people, but also for younger people. And they realize that they need to cooperate. I think that as in many cases, the extremists are very, very small groups of people. And I think it's the same in Israel. The Haredi population in its entirety and the majority, the large, large majority, were extremely cooperative, uh, speaking in their radio. And actually, I was invited to a few radio shows explaining the virus and the problems to the community, explaining the issue of social distancing, explaining the issue of hand sanitation. I think there's a huge amount of understanding within the Haredi community the importance of these measures. So I think we need to be very careful not to put aside and say that all the Haredi we're not cooperative. It's the wrong thing. There's a very small group that is making a lot of noise, but it's a very small minority. Negligible. Hey, and I think I think the same is true in the United States as well. Um, so one question we're getting and um, from our, the viewers is about um, immunity and antibodies, and it's something that we talk a lot about in the United States as well. Um, there may be some research that suggests that the immunity doesn't last that long, at least among certain segments of those who have uh, who have been infected. Um, what are you seeing in Israel on that front? The answer is that we don't know yet. And sometimes it's important to say we don't know yet. And the reason is that this disease is with us for about the most, if we look at when it started in China, four months. And we don't have yet enough information. I think as we go, I think that within a few months, we'll have a little bit more information and then next year we'll have much more. But I fully agree with those who think that there's a very good chance that we won't have a long-standing immunity for the virus. 
you know, give you a simple explanation for that. If we remember the flu, the flu, for some reason, we don't develop long lasting uh, immunity for the flu. We need to get the flu shot every year. Uh, the coronavirus is very close to the flu. On the other hand, we have measles. Measles, if you're exposed, you'll have an immunity for your entire life. We don't know why and what's the difference. There's an understanding that maybe there are uh, uh, certain parts of the vir virus, the parts of the virus that are very much activating the immune system and maybe in this case not. However, I'm not sure about that. I think we need to wait. And the answer is sometimes you need to say, I don't know. Thank you. Um, one of the uh, things we've learned, those of us who are amateur epidemiologists, is that uh, th this is a virus that, at least in part, passed in the air, that either through droplets or aerosols. Um, and I know there's even a debate about what constitutes an aerosol versus what constitutes a droplet. Um, one of the viewers just asked a question about contaminated surfaces and had just read a report that I haven't seen yet that contaminated surfaces are not so likely to transmit the virus. Is that something that you're looking at in Israel and at Hadassah? Have you, uh, what, what is the current state of the science on that? First of all, first of all, there, there were at least two studies that looked at the ability of the virus to survive in, uh, on surfaces. And these studies have demonstrated the virus on different surfaces can, can survive in one study even up to 72 hours. And for this reason, actually, when we are taking materials that were in the corona unit and were exposed to a corona patient, we put these, devi these devices or these machines into quote unquote quarantine for about a week, a week and a half, 10 days, just to be on the safe side. Uh, we are well aware that there's a possibility that the virus will be spread through contact with surfaces. And there's a very, I don't know if people have seen it, but I, I've seen it on the BBC. The BBC has shown a very nice video that was produced in, in Japan showing what happens when people use, uh, are coughing and then into their hands and then are taking food while and how it spreads quickly within a dining room. And for this reason, I would say that we should err on the side of caution. I think this is one of the reasons that it's also important to use the masks. And I mean, I, at the beginning, we thought that we don't need to put masks and there's no need. And today, I think the entire community has completely changed 180 degrees. And we understand that we must go with masks, not in order to protect ourselves, but protect others. But because we, when we cough, we spread the virus to very long distances, up to eight meters. I don't know how much it is in yards and feet, but it's up to two, uh, eight meters, and this is a very long distance. It is indeed. Um, one question that we have is about, uh, are visitors allowed in the country? What are the protocols in place? And obviously, it's a debate we're seeing um, in the United States and elsewhere as well. Israel is opening up slowly to uh, people to come back to Israel with, in, with flights. Uh, at this point, every person that comes back to Israel must be in quarantine for 14 days. So he must have, he must prove that he has a place to stay and he needs to stay in isolation for 14 days and only then he can come in and join the community. And Israel is very strict about that. The fact is of the matter is that even if you do a test and the test shows that you're negative for RT-PCR, that you're negative for the virus, you still have to stay 14 days in isolation before you're allowed to join the community. Got it. Um, the um, issues, and this is, I'm riffing off of a question here about a vaccine. If it, if it happened to be invented um, in uh, Hadassah, or elsewhere in Israel, would Israel um, make it so that the rest of the world could access it easily, just as it did in that, uh, the ventilator? Um, it's a question I know many people are asking around the world. We don't know who will come up with a vaccine, and we don't know what access the rest of the world will have. What is your thinking on that? What is the current thought about that within Israel and the public health community? I, I want to hope that, first of all, if Israel develops a vaccine, it will be happy to share it with all other countries in the world and all other 
medical centers in the world. And I'm sure that if it would if we would have developed a vaccine at Adassa, or we will develop a vaccine at Adassa, we'll do the same thing. However, I think that in order to develop a vaccine is can be very expensive, and we will have to find ways to, to support this effort. And now I'm talking generally speaking, and I think the effort to vaccinate the 9 billion people that we have on Earth today is a amazing task, an enormous task that will require a lot of very, very clever people to think how we do that. And this will be a very important issue that we'll have to address. Uh, who, what are the countries that get to be vaccinated first? What are the countries that where you can wait with the vaccination? And other questions that will come up as we go along and we have a vaccine. So vac by the way, what I want to say is that actually the moment we will have a vaccine and we'll identify a vaccine, to the time that we'll have everybody vaccinated will take some time. And it will be a very complicated task, not only from the medical point of view, but also from the logistic point of view of how to do that. Um, so, interesting question. Um, I understand that there was a certain youngster signing up for the Young Judea's Global Year course in Israel, which is a great program. I know long time affiliated with Adopt as well. Uh, and many parents are asking themselves, uh, you know, what, what to do about their, um, about young Jews who are going to Israel to study next year, maybe Hebrew University, maybe Young Judea. There's discussion camps, many camps have closed. There's one Jewish camp that's decided to stay open. What's your public health advice at this point? If you had an 18 or 19 year old um, who, who wanted to come in, uh, on a year of study in, uh, in Israel, what would you tell their parents right now? What you did just now, you're putting me in trouble with Janice. <laughs> because, <laughs> <laughs> listen, I, I'll give you, it, it's, listen, it's a very, this is the most difficult question you can ask me. And I'll try to answer it in, in my, in the way I see it, in my perspective. So as a father, I have two daughters. As a father, I won't let them out of my sight. And the reason is that I want to have them close to me. And this is my answer as a father. As an Israeli, I'm very proud. I think that if you look where Israel is today when it comes to controlling the virus, I think we come up as one of the safest countries in the world. And uh, I can tell you that some European countries that have the virus under control have already told Israel that they want to open uh, S the airspace between the two countries. However, Israel is the one who's giving trouble also to our visitors, because at this point, Israel is not so keen in having tourists. And any tourist is deemed as an Israeli coming back to Israel. Any tourist must stay 14 days in isolation. I don't know any tourist who will come to for a visit to Israel and will stay for two, 14 days in isolation. It's different with students. Now here I can give you a story about a friend of mine, an American, whose his daughter is studying at a, at a Tel Aviv University. And when asked whether she should come back, he said, no, stay in Israel, I think it's fine there. So uh, saying that, I think Israel is a safe country today with, regarding the coronavirus. We're very proud about that. I think the Israeli health system has proven itself. But as a father, I will keep my, my family close to me at this time, and I won't go around the world. Right. Janice, yes. have, have you and Adasa thought about um, what advice you're giving your constituents who kids and grandkids might be going on programs, what you're doing with your own programs? I think you're, you're muted, Janice. Okay, I, there are two aspects to this, David. One is um, our camps here in the United States and the ones in Israel. Clearly, we would not advocate on behalf of traveling at this time. Um, however, each of the Young Judea camps here in the United States, each one is being examined independently and carefully to see uh, whether or not they are in a condition to accept um, young people, how they would manage that. Um, in most cases, they will not be opening, but there might be a few cases in which the conditions are such that we can make them available to younger uh, people. And I think for everybody, it's a matter of really taking it case by case. Right. 
I have an um, interesting uh, question here from Rabbi Neil Borovitz. Um, what, what is the rate of infection among Arab citizens, among Palestinians? You know, I know that early on, there was a lot of concern about Gaza, which is a very dense population. Um, how has that been managed? And also uh, among Har Haredim as well, what, 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 are the, what are the differences in how populations are, are dealing with this and being infected? Well, I, I should say that we were all concerned about what will happen with COVID-19 in the Palestinian uh, Authority, both in the West Bank and Gaza. And I should say that the Palestinians also, uh, talking to them, were very, very concerned. And they took very drastic measures to isolate. And when they had an outbreak in Bethlehem, they basically put them in quarantine the entire city for two weeks. And they were able, as we did, to control the outbreak. And for this reason, I think that's the reason you didn't see a major outbreak in Gaza or in the West Bank. And this is really because of them using very strong uh, quarantine and isolation methods that were used. Mm -hmm. But the Israeli Arab population, this is a little bit more diff different. There, we saw a level of infection rate that was closer the infection rate at the beginning in Israel, but they also now are completely under control. And I think also with the Khalidim, I should say, please remember when I'm saying that we see one or two cases a day or 20 cases in the entirety of Israel, this is nothing compared to 500 or more cases that we saw in the, at the peak of the outbreak. So we are we're very, I think all of us, the long way into having the COVID-19 under control. Is Israel doing serological testing? Is it trying to find out what percentage of the population has been exposed, infected, um, and um, how it might, um, and what that needs for herd immunity? The answer is yes. Uh, I think that people will try it, and that's why I mentioned before that it's mostly within the Haredi community. The reason is that this is the community where there was the highest rate of infection. If you go to the secular community in Tel Aviv, the chances of you finding someone who really was ex exposed to the virus is very, very low. So the herd immunity in Israel in a totality is relatively very low. And I mentioned in order to have really an efficient herd immunity, you must have, you must hit about 75 to 80% people that have been infected or vaccinated in order to get to the herd immunity. And I think Israel as the United States is a far away from herd immunity. I would mention to that that even Sweden, where they basically decided not to put people into quarantine, not to do isolation, continue to sit, to sit in restaurants. They had a very high rate, a relatively high rate of death among elderly people, but or even they don't have a high rate of herd immunity or, or people that were exposed to have herd immunity. So I think it's a long reach. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, we really appreciate uh, your time. We really appreciate this opportunity to partner with Hadassah. Um, Janice said that she was schooled in JCRC. I was schooled in Hadassah. Many Hadassah women uh, took me under their wing when I was a young JCRC staffer in, um, in the early 1990s. Um, I hope you all will um, consider supporting both JCPA and Hadassah for their work. These are very challenging times and um, we, are, uh, we need to do our best work now. And um, we would hope that you all will uh, see fit to, to support our organizations. Janice, I'll let you have uh, the last word. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I think your words about cooperation and collaboration and support um, are certainly um, shared by Hadassah. Um, we have worked together in the past. We look forward to work together in the future. We do have a website, which is um, Hadassah, um, Hadassah, I'll give it to you in a minute, Hadassah.org slash COVID um, advocacy. If there is anybody who is interested in getting involved in some of the issues that we're dealing with um, through legislation, again, it's hadassah.org slash COVID advocacy. And clearly this is an area where our 
joint memberships are certainly can make a difference together. So we encourage um, members of our joint communities to really pursue advocacy that can help um, the members of our community and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can find us at jewishpublicaffairs.org as well. Thank you so much to everyone, and we will look forward to further discussions with you all. Take care.